Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Flix Picks in the Net Picks, and I am your host, No Seven Eighteen. And we're back at it again, and I'm here with my co-host, Mr. T the Cool T. Alright, man. So, uh, this is episode two, and this is good because we're now into episode two, and I'm feeling real good about everything. And um, since the the second pick isn't going, second flick isn't picked by m- me. I'm gonna let T introduce the film that he decided to pick. T. Oh, the film that I think is very special to me. This film was made in 1988. That is over 30 years ago, 32 years to be exact. And I consider this film to be, for me, not only one of the greatest films ever made, but I consider this film to be the greatest action film ever made. And it is the only action movie that I think is worthy of an Academy Award nomination for Best Picture. And 32 years later, I still hold up today as a classic. And I, again, I'll say it again. It, to me, is the greatest action film ever made. And that is Die Hard. All right, all right. So... It's funny that you posed that question because I know we've talked about this over the years and you let me, I already know how near and dear this film is to to you, to your heart, which is kind of fitting because the first film was prominent for me. Most importantly, probably because, especially to the channels, because it was my, a movie based on the first video I've ever done on a movie was on that movie and for our first premiere episode, we did Man of Steel, which is dope. So it's only fitting that your pick now, your and this was your first pick for the for the series, was one of your favorite action film. I mm-hmm. think it's quite poetic. So, mm-hmm. as you already said, started in nineteen eighty eight. Could you just uh, give us a brief synopsis on the film? Sure. So, Bruce Willis plays New York City detective John McClane, and he's estranged from his wife, uh, played by Bonnie Bedelia. And she has taken a job in Los Angeles at this building called the Nakatomi Plaza, which is like a skyscraper. Bruce Willis during the Christmas holiday is going out to visit his wife and their children. They have two children together. When he goes to the building to meet his wife, the building is subsequently at the same time taken over by terrorists. Um, And Bruce Willis seems to escape. So the whole movie is about how he's stuck in this confined area in this building and what he has to do to stop the terrorists in this confined space. And it only takes over, the movie only takes place in this one place in over a few hours. And that's the, that's the, back, that's the synopsis of the movie. Oh, all right. Cool, cool, cool. Well, I mean, for me, I mean, I got a lot of years in with this film. Um... A lot of toys were being played (laughs) while this movie was in the background. And it's definitely something that I've grown up with for years. And when T let me know about this being his pick for a movie, I actually watched it earlier today. And it was the first time I've seen it in some some years, actually. First time I actually watched this movie in some years. And it was great to watch it after all that time and seeing it like with brand new pair pair of eyes. So now, let's get into the picks, because that's the show. We're going to get into our major picks of the film that stand out. It's not about being good or not. You can tell when we talk about the picks. So since this is T's uh, flick, and he picked this flick, um, I'm going to have you set off and set the tone for what is your major pick. First major pick. My first major pick is two words, Bruce Willis. Mm. I think. Now, there is another YouTuber named Grace Randolph, and she quotes, I believe, Paul Newman. And she always says that Paul Newman has a quote about putting me in the right role is priceless. Bruce Willis is priceless in this movie. There is nothing I can say negative about 
his performance from the serious, quiet moments to the wisecracking New York joke moments. Um, he is, he is priceless. He carries the movie. And just to give you a little backstory, Bruce Willis was a TV actor working on a show, Moonlight. The original Die Hard was offered to, I believe, Richard Gere. Mm. And they couldn't find an actor. Richard Gere had turned down. I believe it was Richard Gere. And they couldn't find an actor. And Bruce Willis auditioned for it. And, of course, the studio and the director, John McTiernan, took a chance on him. And what a gamble did they... What a gamble paid off. Because he was a comedic actor. And obviously he had to go to the gym and work out a little bit and just show that he can do this. And absolutely priceless. This is what you get when you get the right actor in the right role. But that sounds like one of those stories, um, those weird, almost like cinematic stories about how it really wasn't meant, a role meant for you and you just happen to walk in audition and the first major film that you have was almost mm -hmm. tailored fit for your whole prowess and what you bring to the screen outside of what people actually would expect mm -hmm. from you at the moment. And just to keep going with Bruce Willis, obviously it's an action movie. Before then, what did we have? Uh, Schwarzenegger, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Stallone. It was, and I'm not taking nothing away from big guys, a lot of muscles, rippling abs, they had to be super martial artists, you know, commando, Rambo, they were always some special forces. Bruce Willis played a New York City cop. He clearly went to the gym, but he wasn't, he had a guy who he looked like worked out. He was in action, but he looked like a regular I, I like guy. A blue, he, like, he looked like a blue-collar blue worker, blue-collar bill. Like blue-collar worker. He looked like a guy that went to the gym maybe three, four times a week, maybe for Maybe for an hour. The, the, and, the, the 80s gyms. The 80s gyms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. so, and, and it was just... And I just found his performance... There was a certain groundedness to it. A certain realness to it. Um, and again, I can just... Like his portrayal of John McClane. So my first pick is Bruce Willis. Um... Well, my thoughts on that is that absolutely, you're absolutely right. I think that's a, a great pick to, to lead off with because this was a film that seemed pretty much Taylor fit for his what he can naturally bring to the screen before we ever really need to create much of an archetype for the character. I think it was just one of those moments where it was a character that would just Taylor fit for what you naturally bring to the camera. And anything else is just remembering nines and having the proper chemistry and on and off screen chemistry with your director as well. Because there was a lot of close up shots, tight shots where you had to take a lot of cues, I would expect, directly from the director to pull off each scene within the frame. But before I even get into my first pick, I wanted to pose... A question that hopefully by the end of this episode, maybe we all can answer. And that is, and I didn't even realize it was much of a, uh, a question I've heard. I think Grace Randolph, it's funny you brought her up. I think she was one or maybe even like a John Campia or a Robin Meyer Burnett that had brought up the question. And it seems to be now with some, maybe it's been, it's been going on trending a lot longer than I knew, but uh, is this considered... A Christmas movie. Now, for me, beginning, before I even wa watched it, my thoughts on even just the idea of that was kind of interesting. It, it did take place on Christmas, but I never even looked at it like a Christmas film, at least up to that point, till people started questioning it. And then it's been in my head, and as I've seen a lot of people actually bring it up, it seems to be a trending thing, is this... A Christmas movie, hopefully by the end of our picks and nitpicks, we will come up with come up with the answer to that. Now, let's go off with yours truly. First pick of the film is, and I will probably be titling this one as John and Mrs. McLean sitting in the tree. Okay. <laughs> the title 
characters chemistry and i don't like to be because i had to watch this before i came into it and you know me i always say I, I don't like going to movie theaters with a pen and a pad but i've seen this movie several times over so i already knew it and i didn't want to cheat the audience and not take this serious and not watch it prior to uh recording so i watched this literally up to uh t will tell you he was calling me up when we're gonna go i'm like i'm still in the middle of the movie so now that I'm there, I have, I, 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 I have, I have a lot to say within this, just seeing it for the first time in a long time. And the chemistry between John and McLean and Miss McLean, actually, Holly. Holly, excuse me, Holly carries the whole entire film. It, it, the film really lives and dies on do you believe that this kind of separated couple coming together, seeing each other after so many months apart, and this the same motel tale kind of, we're not sure if we're going to divorce, but you're moving that way, I'm moving this way. You could kind of tell there was an argument between the two, but they're still technically married. When he gets up there and finds out she's using her maiden name, it doesn't help. No. <laughs> but with all of that being said, this film really lives and dies on you believing that they had that backstory and the fact that he would really risk it all for her. And you had to also believe that they made sense together. And she's a little smart ass. <laughs> like, she's a real smart ass. Please, please Just like gonna, he is. You're going to tell you what I want you to say. Please tell me. Oh, uh, I mean, if we're talking about the part where she says about um when, he, when you see the... What's the gentleman's name? Carl comes out and slamming the thing after you know they still couldn't couldn't get get uh John and she's like yo you could her friend um Holly's friend was saying the pregnant woman was like yo something got that dude pissed off and she was like it's John only John would get someone that angry but even so how she was when he brought when when they killed Mister Takano uh what what's his name uh um. Nakatomi. Nak Nakatomi. When they when he got knocked off and she had to basically be the voice how she came in and she owned the air around in front of the leader of the terrorists. Well, you nominated me the moment you killed him. Yep. She's a slick broad. <laughs> this is a slick tongue broad. But she carried it with such femininity. She was still cute because she was all a little bit like what what is she like five foot two? <laughs> <laughs> she's a little itty bitty thing and she just had that spunk that was still soft but very much a compliment towards this blue collar rugged john mcclain and may for I her to be this when you're done. huh sorry sorry may i piggyback when you're done oh okay okay yeah for for you to have this delicate petite but fireball with this kind of i don't want to say brooding but this average joe kind of with this al bundy melancholy if you will about him it just works so when i meant to do some um what i was trying to say from earlier in, in taking notes and stuff like that i don't like to watch films writing as I watch, I think that's kind of co a corny way to go into the film. That's what I was intending on in the very beginning when I brought it up. But I almost wanted to count the minutes that they were actually on screen. Because they weren't really on screen a lot. And that one but the argue, movie makes you seem like they're together the whole movie. Yeah, it made you feel like this was a day in the life of Al Bundy. You know what I mean? Like you could tell that there was a 360 back, very relatable, blue collar, middle class family story of I'm the wife is trying to elevate, go someplace else. Well, I got my job all the way out here in New York. And well, I gotta go. Well, and you know, there's a big blow up, a little brouhaha, if you will. She go bounce 
with the kids because clearly this is the job that has is going to garner the money. So she probably will be the this is the job that's going to probably put her into carrying the family monetarily for where she's going to the trajectory trajectory of her career. And he didn't back her. And you could kind of tell there was a big riff and he didn't just want to leave New York. He's from New York. You know, you know, I'm sure the idea came up. You could transfer over here, but I'm a New York. You know, it just seemed like a regular real world middle class family argument that could actually splinter the family. And we were in the middle of that. And and, and, and it was well. Ah, man. What is the director's name? John McTerran. John McTerran. Yeah. The way just to he, give you a backstory, he, John yeah. McTiernan is the first director of Predator. Just to give you a backstory. Oh, that <laughs> would make sense. Predator. That he would directed be... the original Predator of Arnold Schwarzenegger, John McTiernan. Okay, <laughs> that's good to know. Then, then that could also express why it was well executed because you, for the the driver to kind of be the the audience, if you will. By having the conversation there while he was John McClane trying to be standoffish. And he's just filling in the blanks. Oh, I can tell this is some bullshit. You fucked up. <laughs> Y'all just, you know, like he he just was able to isolate the real world conflict between in this 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 household. And it really fleshed out John McClane on the ride getting to there. Then when you see them actually together, and even when she was on the phone like talking to him actually not talk, talking to him talking to the um nanny about like getting that the, the 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 guest house so you knew it was a bad argument the guest room why the guest mm-hmm. room y'all still married you could tell everything that was chosen had such a nuance to it to give you a three-dimensional story to let you know the fact that he's gonna it's expected that he'll sleep in the guest house and he's expecting to, I mean, guest room, and he's expecting to have to stay with a buddy of his that happened to be living out there. It lets uh-huh. you know they were coming in on two opposite ends. They was ready to go gunslinging. Like the idea was, was that. But really, if you look at the big teddy bear, he really came to make up. Uh-huh. That was his yeah. intention. And, and and if I can just like kind of end off here, you could kind of tell that she, even though that they knew that they were going, coming up to me and it was supposed to be more for the kids, she wanted the room to be made, even though she, because she expected him not to even want to be there because he don't want to support. But you know what? Let's have the room ready because I'm hoping that he, he would stay. Like I said, see how we could just stay in the moment of that real world. It was in just very little you draw so much out of it by the time that we sit them in the room together for the first time and they do not meet for well after two hours after that. well not maybe not well after but about two hours after that it's mm-hmm. like you just couldn't skip a beat you felt it you felt it and you wanted to see them reconnect because they had a chemistry i could have believed that they would have had a sitcom together mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you, hey, may I add something to Oh, please. That? If you would have told me that Bruce Willis and Bonnie Bedelia were married in real life, I would have believed it. In a nutshell. <laughs> and, and here's another thing. When you talk about the marriage and how much they loved each other, now, if you grew up in the scene with, where she said only John could drive somebody crazy, you know it's the scene that even talking about it now, I actually have literally goosebumps, but I was like, that's a wife. You know what's the scene I'm going to tell you? What? When the guy, Ellis, goes into the room to betray John, and he tells her, your husband, what does your husband think he's, what does John think he's doing? And she goes, his job. <laughs> yep. Like, like, even though they're arguing. She knows him. That, yeah, but also the fact that they were arguing, but what does that dude say something foul about her husband? What does your husband think he's doing? His job. Mm-hmm. And she said it real quick. And I was like, that's a wife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that's even guest house everything you just said once they saw that John got away and the gay was all mad and they saw that a couple of two got killed off and Ellis was like I'm gonna go in there I do million dollar deals before you what does your husband think he's doing his job hmm. and I said wow that's the wife <laughs> now that's a whole and fact I love, I love that scene because it was just straightforward his job that's what my husband does well, I mean, well, now what's up to you, good sir? Your next uh, pick. So my next pick um, is 
it's funny because I'm going to switch it around. Because you went to the relationship between uh, Bonnie Bedelia and Bruce Willis, I'm going to go to the relationship between Bruce Willis and Reginald Val Johnson. Okay. Who played, who played the, the... I forgot the mm-hmm. cop's name. But it's, oh, the, I'm Al. But you know what? I always yeah, thought I, his name was Carl. For some reason, I always I know, thought his he, name was Carl in the yeah. movie because I know his name is really Carl. No, actually, no, no, it's not. not. His name is Carl Winslow and whatchamacallit. Uh, but I feel like he played another Carl elsewhere. And I always well, thought maybe. it was Carl in this. But anyway. But I, I really enjoyed their camaraderie. And remember how I said Bonnie Bedelia backed up Bruce Willis with that one scene? Mm-hmm. Here's the scene where the fans and the, the other people come in. And this is the scene where Bruce Willis you know, he blows up the building, and, you know, the, the captain tells Al, at any moment you could be relieved of duty and go home. And Al says, do you think <laughs> if, he makes, you know, he goes, if he makes it out alive, do you think he gives a damn to be to do to him? And he goes, at any moment, Sergeant, you can go home. He mm-hmm. goes, sir, you couldn't drag me from here. Mm-hmm. Yep. Remember, he don't, even, he don't even know Bruce Willis. But that little thing that they shared, Nah, but I ain't leaving. Mm. And it was like, you would think that they were friends forever because it was kind of one of those, yo, know, my man is in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, like when he said, he did all this, and he said, you think he gives it, if he makes it out alive, you know, he said, he's scared, he's tired, he ain't seen nothing from us. You can tell I love this movie, I'm mm-hmm. quoting it. He ain't seen nothing from us down here. You think he gives a damn what you're going to do to him if he makes it out alive? And the captain's like, you can leave at any time. He says, sir, you can't drag me out. Mm-hmm. And then remember, he's talking to his superior. And, and those are the moments where it was like, this ain't even about rank. Something things higher. Now, nah, I ain't leaving. It's a cop thing. I mean, I mean it's a brotherhood. They they just had a bond. Yeah, a, but but also I mean, that like, but also I think it was most important because he's a cop. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. we're cops. And I think that was the bond. That's why he was like, mm-hmm. I can read him out. You can't he, we're cops. Or even at the end. Remember, they never seen each other. Remember mm-hmm. at the end when Bruce Willis, you know, survives and he looks at him and that quiet Al and they just start laughing. They just like, know, yeah. mm-hmm. But they, he just knew it was you. Mm-hmm. He just walks out as mad cops. He looks and just goes, Al. Well, I mean, they were just staring he, at each other, but yeah. <laughs> It's like, yeah. And they just and, and they and they gave a real a hug. You know what I mean? A very believable hug, yeah. Yeah, very, it's very believable. So that is my my next pick. Since you brought up the relationship between him and the wife, I mean his his pseudo partner. Okay. Okay. So that, um well my thoughts on that is uh, I, I I totally concur. I really think that especially for most of them, for them to carry the relationship never even on screen all the way up to where they ended. I think the way the director went about peppering the conversations throughout and also letting you know that they were actually bonding. And uh, you got to give uh Reginald Vell Johnson a lot of credit. Even though he sold Carl Winslow, they needed a Carl Winslow. Yeah. He was the perf he was designed to be the 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 guy that you just did it even you you the last guy you'd expect to be there, but the only guy that could have bonded with a guy like him. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he's just now starting his family with his wife. It was, they were two blue collar guys. And mm-hmm. these are the type of guys that probably at like a cop bar, they would have chopped it up and been lifelong homeboys. Mm-hmm. But uh, in any event, for my second pick, it really had to be tension. I yeah. think um, the director had made sure to pepper a lot of key scenes from the vents to the closed places to just even though it was a small moment, him having to be underneath the table while the guy is on top and he's following no more desk. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was al- There was always a moment where John, they let you know exactly how alone John is. And even in a lone moment, he could, like, hit the lighter and let you know. Like, like, and he always got, like, a little little cheesy quip right in the middle, ready for you. 
Because no matter where he is, how he is, he's always John. Mm -hmm. And every thing that he went through it was almost like American Gladiator for him. There was always a new level, and it was a it was a very for for people to say that there's an, never been a good video game movie. This is how you should structure one. To be quite honest, and, and if you can let me carry this thought just a tad further. He had limited resources. He didn't even have shoes. So shoot the glass. He's always had an obstacle that was in front of him as he went to each level till he got to the end of the explosion and then the final end boss. It really was even before the explosion he had to he had to go through Sagat before he got to M. Bison and by the time he got through M. Bison, which could probably be the explosion from the top, you could say he met Akuma or the real M. Bison, if you will, uh, Hans Gruber. And the way they kept ratcheting each moment up, taking it up the next level, on uh, the next level, and. You know, the the, the, the the wife beater got grayer and grayer and grayer, which could have been a cast member onto itself. To the fact that I think they almost felt like they gave, gave him, they didn't even blacken it. I almost felt like they gave him just a black wife beater at one point. So I said, fuck it. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I, I really think that how the director showed the tight close quarters from the vents and always parrying between where the villain was where he's trying to get to how he's trying to how they organized each and every shot for where john mcclain was where he was going to to where the bad guys are now trying to lead off and figure out where he is so when they get to him when even when they just mi miss and the obstacle he gets off or gets over to get to the next stage if you will and it was very much like a video game and you would think that a video game could pick a movie with use that as some sort of idea in which how to pace out a film if you will or go just to level it out but either way you look at it like i said the scenes of tension i thought was shot like probably i could honestly say you could see where this up the level of action films you could honestly see where they was like this this has to be one of those key frames in, mm -hmm. in in terms of action filmmaking that says all right now how do we take it to that that ushered in your 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 lethal weapons and all of that you know what i'm saying may i may i jump in thoughts oh excellent and i'm gonna piggyback of what you said when you said about building tension what I love is they built the tension and it upped the level and it never seemed cartoony. Like, mm. for example, and I'm going to show you, you brought up a key scene, and I'm going to show you what good directing is. When he says shoot the, shoot the glass, right? Mm -hmm. and all the glass is on the floor. John's machine gun runs out, so he's just got his handgun. He looks across and he sees the exit. But when he looks down, he sees all the glass and he looks at his feet. Tell me you did this. Tell me without even seeing you run. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Those were one of the best, the, the moments that actually stood out like you growing up. As like, as that's as one as of the biggest man. moments. Shooting the glass as and as then as you as just as look as down and it's like, damn. I got, but, but as an audience member, you looked at him, looked at his feet, all the glass, and you knew he had to run. Mm-hmm. And, and so we didn't have to see a scene of him running and his feet being cut. You already, once he looked down and you showed his feet in the glass, you as the audience member say, damn. It's just gonna hurt. Like, you know I mean? like, and one thing I will what? say that's very, if I could jump in real, real quick, is something that the director decided to do, which I thought was very interesting. He set up a lot of things that was you, we was gonna have to revisit that was in the very beginning. Even when he was like, "Yo, the guy told him, oh, be barefoot on a car, on on." Yeah. On, on, on the uh, carpet, that's one of the first thing he does that balls his feet into a fist. And he was like, yeah, right, whatever, that shit sounded stupid. He said, yeah, but it's what I do. And then what they do just before he meets his wife, when he comes in, he tries, he's, I mean, he goes, 
I'll get the fuck out of here. I actually do feel all right. Yeah. And the fact that not when they took over the building, he never even got to get his shoes back on. It just set it up from the very beginning that that was something that he was eventually going to have to deal with when he even ran into Hans Gruber. And he looked down at his feet. He was like, yeah, you know, well, I could have got caught with my pants down. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and it was like you kind of knew everything that as it built up, where this was going to lead, even down to them finding out that he had a family and kids. And then you start to realize why he had to use, I mean, well, it's obvious why he had to use different names, but as it unraveled even further, he really had to make sure they didn't know that his wife was down there. He needed to yeah. them to think that he was a random motherfucker. Yeah, that, but, and also, when you talk about tension, the, and, and it's intelligent tension. When he meets Hans Gruber, and he asks him, what's your name? And he says, Bill Clay. And he, and he didn't realize Bruce Willis already read the thing, and he already knew he was lying. And when he gave him the empty gun, mm -hmm. that whole scene between them, when he pulls the trigger, and Bruce Willis goes, oops, no bullets. What do you think, I'm fucking stupid? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like it was, I love that scene. He knew he gave him the empty gun, but when he pulled the trigger, he was like, you think I'm fucking stupid? And you know what's crazy? That was such a man New York shit. Mm. You think I'm fucking stupid? Like, <laughs> and then obviously, and then when the when the elevator, Hans goes, you were saying, because his voice came. Mm -hmm. um, or, or when Bruce Willis jumped off the roof. You know what's the scene I love? When he makes it through, when he jumps off the roof, he crashes through the glass. Mm -hmm. Remember when the, 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 the hose fell down and it was almost going to pull him off? Yeah, that was like the next level no, and the remember, obstacle, but, just when you, you know thought, thought you made the, it. But no, but what I thought was great acting is when he gets free and he has that facial expression like, <sighs> you're like, I mean, you know what I mean? And then he realized the shit came down. It's like, oh, shit. And, or, I thought, you know, you talked about the little jokes. When he's in the, when he's in the, the he the, says the, something, something, something. We can have a few laughs. I forgot yeah, how he's. But you, know, but you know what's funny? That was a real. How many times in real life has you been invited somewhere, something goes wrong, and you speak to yourself? Yeah. Like it was a, I never found any of the jokes corny. I, mm. I it was just really. That's something I would have said. Come up to the camera, we have a few laughs. Yeah, right. <laughs> like you know what I mean. So I thought that. Just when it comes to building tension, yeah, the director, I, I thought it was just a great, uh, great marriage of tension. I guess it's Michael, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So, here's where I'm going to go, because we went to tension. Action sequences. Mm -hmm. This movie has some of the best bare-knuckle raw action sequences I've seen. Even for the fight scene. And you know what I love? It was just raw fight scene. And... Bruce Willis talking about the fight scene. Motherfucker, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was <laughs> rambling a lot. <laughs> yeah, and the funny thing is, I've seen real fights where dudes are locked in headlocks and they're hurting at each other. Mm -hmm. You know, like the scene where, the, you know, where he, um, where he fights uh, the dude, the main bad guy, now Hans Gruber, his main guy. When uh, he Carl. Fights him. Carl, when the guy puts the gun, he goes, we're both professionals, and Bruce Willis knocks the gun, and he just pushes him, starts punching him, and then when they're rolling around, you hear Bruce Willis, motherfucker, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> like, and it's almost like during the fight, he's hyping himself up. Shoot, I even realize he, he screamed, but motherfucker, I'll kill you. I gotta go watch like, oh, that when again. He has him, when he has him in the headlock before he chops him, what does Bruce Willis say? I'm gonna fucking cook you, I'm gonna fucking eat you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, he was really talking during the fight, but even the shootout scene, I thought this had some really raw, bare knuckle action sequences really just from the fight scenes to the machine gun scene to you know i just thought these had some really that's it raw bare knuckle action sequences i never saw action sequences like that where it was just they were tense they were raw like it wasn't a bad damn stylized fight scene and also when he fights the main bad guy the main bad guy is doing all the kung fu karate stuff Bruce Willis is just fighting for his life, but you could tell he's a guy I've been in a fight. You know what I mean? I mean, and that's one thing they really uh, executed well. They, it, it, he wasn't, like you said, it wasn't a Van Damme show or display. Right. It wasn't 
it wasn't none of those clean stuff. It was just raw, but you could tell. I've been in a few I've fights. Been fight. I've been in fights been before. In before. But, 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 but this, and I'm going to fight you very, just using the environment around him. He, he kept it like a real street fight. Mm-hmm. And where this guy was trying to use all his little kung fu training or whatever, he was like, nah. And you could tell, like, you know, Bruce Willis didn't come off like he was never a trained dude, but he was fighting for his life. I mean, he had no shoes on. It was just a different, it's yeah. a different type of scenario. So mm-hmm. yeah, without question. So I thought, I thought action sequence wise, I thought it was just amazing. The action sequences, it was just, it goes with the tension were tense action sequences that were real raw, gritty, bare knuckle action sequences. Well, your, your turn. Well, my next one would be, and I, I guess I touched on it already, but it needs to be like like signal singled out is is the pacing as its own separate thing. The pacing and how they knew exactly when to bring the joke in, when to show that if. If Bruce Willis is hanging from here and he has to swing before the the the, the rope on the gun because the gun was kind of like holding him in place while while he hung off the um the shoulder the sh- shoulder carrier on it he had to use that to drape down so he could jump off to the ventilation system. When you see this whole sequence from going from there to going catching it to the villain trying to find him just missing him and then he gets into a new situation where the new obstacle is now i'm in the vent he makes a joke you know yeah come out here yeah, have a few drinks and have a few laughs right now he's in the vent they're still looking for him because remember he told him to come down he was like fuck that i'm gonna go find this nigga went down there pulled his strap out started shooting up the top of the vent because he trying to bring him out just that fluid motion of it kept the kept the me as an audience member totally engaged totally uh, aware and and totally into the film i mean it really knows how to pace you from one situation to another and i like to talk about even just going through the thing of shooting the glass and he looks at his foot and then all of a sudden there was no need to show him running it just looking mm-hmm. at his feet, we felt it. So when he opened up the door, and I always remember as a kid seeing that foot dragging all that blood, it was like, damn, you know that shit was in his foot. <laughs> like, that shit was not, that was the real hot potato. And they didn't even need to see it just to get us to the next scene because it it, it, it was handled beautifully because the weight of what we did it seem hit us as soon as we seen him dragging himself through the door in the trail of blood right behind but the pacing of going from one scene to the next scene to him like everything just was well paced out scene to scene to scene ratcheting it up at the right moment and knowing exactly when to breathe and exactly when to produce that 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 natural probably unscripted bruce willis off the cuff like uh liners yippee kaye mm-hmm. motherfucker all of that mm-hmm. and i'll be honest with you it was a type of film that was paced in such a way that i think the only other film to take that model and take it to the next level or maybe not the next level but i'll say definitely was a key frame but more a throwback to where I guess this film kind of set it off. And, I, and I'm sorry to say that after all these years, this being one of my top top movies, I want to say even a favorite of mine. Yeah, one of my faves, Speed. Mm-hmm. Because Speed paced itself from one thing to another to another. And I feel like just watching Die Hard, it was like, I wonder if the director of Speed had a certain affinity for this film. Can I can I can I can I give you a, a, a little fact? I'm listening. So the director of Speed's name is Jan DeBont, right? Okay. He's the cinematographer on Die Hard. Cut it out. He yep. cut his teeth on that. That's what's that's what's that's funny. How about that? How about yep. that? His name is his name is Jan DeBont. He was the cinematographer or something I think it was the cinematographer something on Die Hard. How about that? 
that's yep. that that might be something i might have to look at to maybe even do a little i want to do editorials that might be something that's something to, to keep in the corner of my mind yeah but uh anything else thoughts uh no i like i said man die hard is I, I, everything you said i completely agree with also little details like you said from he had to take off his tank top and wrap here's another detail now, it's going to sound weird because somebody pointed it out to me, but the scene where, you know, he ties the hose around and he jumps off the roof and he crashes through the window and the thing almost drags him down. And you know how he has to roll off, right? Mm -hmm. Someone pointed out, if you look at Bruce Willis's chest here, they sprinkled broken glass on it. Hmm. Yep. Like, that's how detailed they were. Hmm. Or after, after you notice parts of the movie he's lifting because of the glass towards the end oh well, like, well he should but the fact that they make sure not to forget yeah, to keep like they made sure not like who like they, 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 it's so it's just very detailed and i just like i said i can really marvel about this movie um so everything you said i agree with so carry us into your next pick if you have another pick no uh no i really don't have another pick i think that i hit it all i think Bruce Willis, the relationships with that he had with his wife, his partner, the actors, I think everybody was casted well. I think the tension, the fact that he had to let Ellis die. Mm. What did he tell him? Tell these people you don't know me, they're going to fucking kill you. Mm -hmm. And then after they shot him, when Han said, yo, maybe I'll shoot everybody and I'll get to someone you do love. Mm -hmm. Now, what was Bruce Willis' response? It wasn't, oh my God, my wife, I'll give myself. It was, go fuck yourself. Because mm -hmm. he was like, and, I know you what, ain't going to do that because that's, that's all you got. Yes. And, and then what did his... The only his leverage you got. Right, right. So then what, the, what did the captain say to, to uh, Al? He just let him down. What did Al say? Yo, if he gives himself up, they'll both be dead. Mm -hmm. So I thought that, or even the scene where you said he was in the shaft, and it wasn't when he shot that I liked. Remember when he started pressing the gun up to see if there was any weight? Yeah. And remember how Bruce Willis tried to creep up a little bit so he didn't feel the yeah, weight? Yeah, he, he tried to move he to had, the side, so yeah. And then, and then remember how he had to take his gun and slowly cock it yeah. and aim it down just in case. Uh -huh. If they figure out, I'm going to try to get one shot off. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I think that, like you said, the tension. So I'm just going to end it well. Well, I guess we'll go to nitpicks, right? No, because I actually had another um pick. Okay, guys, go, go. Um, since you had no more picks, I actually had a fourth one, and it oh. was a dance between the 80s aesthetic, <laughs> and <laughs> but I actually ca capped out to the villains. Yeah. Um, Hans and Carl were the hallmarks um, in terms of classic villainy from the 80s type of style, but it wasn't with this corny veneer it actually brought in the right tension even though hans came off very above ground he was very skeletorish in the way he carried himself because even being on the ground when he acted off like he was like this little weasel scared but he really was no pussy yeah. the and thing is the and thing is yeah 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 the, but the thing is he was that weasel he wasn't really too far off from acting. He just was no pussy because yeah. that was the kind of way he was when he was with the wife, when she was still talking and you just a a, 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 a common thief. He said, no. And it, and he crawled over the same way. He didn't get up and walk over in that cool way, the way he entered when he yeah. took over the building. He was the way he really was as a sniveling idiot. I'm going to sell you this idea that this is for the liberation of the people. But at the bottom line, yeah, I'm a sniveling little ass and, and and the thing is he was because the way he crawled over he was like yeah but i'm an exceptional thief get that shit the fuck right and i thought that he was just a classic a weasel villain that still knew when to carry like he was the supreme threat even though you could tell he wasn't really a fist fighter that he wasn't but he busts his shit and the scene where he's busting his gun, his whole facial expression is different. Yeah, because he's a soldier. You can tell he's a soldier. You yeah, know what I mean? I'm sure he's before. got some hand training, but he was at the muscle. Carl was that. That's what Carl yeah. was about. And I think Carl was he... that same, 
type of henchman, your Goldar, if you will, if you want to citate the Power Rangers. He was just one of those, uh, like, your strong, he was the the guy that was that regal, big, tough, macho guy. But you could tell he wasn't exactly the brains. Not that he was stupid. He was, yo, once you piss me the fuck off, I'm all, I see nothing but red. I'm all green on everything's a go. And that's when you needed like a Hans Gruber. You could tell he's a thinker. I'm not really a fighter. I don't think he's no pussy with the hands. Not to say that we had any moments with him doing it. I just think that that wasn't his area of expertise. Like he's not a fighter. I'll fight your ass. You know what I mean? But I'm not no fighter. But I bust my shit. <laughs> like, 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 don't get this shit fucked up. And I ain't afraid to do it. You know what I'm saying? And I think, I think these, for them to be so different and still so classic was kind of a good standout for the film that I think that was a, a, a strong additive in it. Now, with that being said, that's my last pick. It's on to the nitpicks. You, I'll let you take the lead. Uh, I'm going to be completely honest. I have none. <laughs> I have none. I honestly... And this is what I'm going to say about Chai Hart. And this is why I have no nitpicks. I honestly believe it's a perfect movie from the first frame to the end. I cannot find a... And I, I tried. I cannot find... I think plenty of movies I love that I can find something. I didn't like that. There is nothing in this movie that I do not like. And I will say this. It's not my industry. I'm just a lover. But if you are an up-and-coming director and you want to direct action movies, Die Hard is to be studied. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be mad at that. I mean, Die Hard is to be studied. I mean, but, you, know, you know what's funny? You know what's funny? We gave a Bruce Willis a lot of credit. Let's give a shout out to John McTiernan, the director. Oh yeah, without question, you could tell that uh, this was a marriage of a lot of great moving pieces, and I mm -hmm. really feel like the film shows that these guys had to have had fun. I feel like the yeah, yeah, film yeah, yeah. expresses it's this. Such a, it's such a simple concept. He's stuck in a building with terrorists. But it, it's all about the execution. So I honestly, there are no nitpicks. I really believe Die Hard is a perfect movie from front to end. I honestly stand by that. I know Academy Awards and Oscars don't like action movies. I think Die Hard is worthy of a Best Picture nomination. Not a movie, but I do believe, as you said, let me pick an action movie that could honestly put up there with all the other movies and say, for best picture, I think Die Hard is it. And I'll leave it at that. All right, well, I got nitpicks. Okay, good. Very crazy, but, I, but after the nitpicks, I do have to add another pick, a surprising pick, but I think it was one that went over a lot of people's heads and me watching it again really stood out to me. Okay, but let's get into my nitpicks. Um, one nitpick was when John McClane throws the dude out, out out the window onto the car. That's a minor oh. nitpick, but watching it, I get he had to do that to get his attention. I think that that was more than enough. Him shooting out the window just so you can know where the I'm where I'm at on the floor made sense. I didn't understand why he was shooting at the car. I had to rewind that shit. I'm like, nigga, is you shooting at the car? Cause you kind of really being reckless with your bullets. Cause you could have shot the cop. <laughs> like, like he was really airing okay. off, and I was like, maybe I'm bugging. Cause some shots, it looked like he was shooting straight off, which would have made sense. Because I would air off just so you can feel the aggression. But most importantly, I want you to read what fucking floor I'm on. Okay, I think, okay. but but okay. when it kept showing the car, it kept looking like it was hitting the top of the car. I was like, yo, bro, I think you overdoing the shooting. Cause I would expect it to pierce through the roof, and it could hit. So I okay. thought that was just a little like, ah, I don't know. And, and the way they were cutting it, it was sometimes I don't know if they liked the way the aesthetic of it looking like it's shooting the top of the car or when they showed him firing and it looked like he was, sh at first it looked like he was shooting down, but then when you see them pull back, it looked like he's shooting out, okay. which would make sense. Like he's shooting off to the side, but then it seemed like 
when you see them get by the car, it look like it's hitting the top of the car. And it's like, yo, bro, you wildin' right now. I think you just throwing a guy off the roof. And, 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 and let's be for real. If he was sitting in the car, that might have bust his head, son. Yeah. So, okay. but either way, and I was like, I'd let that slide. You had to throw the body off. And, and if you could get it to hit the car, you got his attention. <laughs> but... The shooting was just a little reckless. I was like, yo, what the fuck? You shooting the car? And it looks cool until it got me thinking like, yo, but bro, you really shooting the car? Like, you really might hit him. But, um, and then my second nitpick, and it might have been a byproduct of the time, but maybe not so much. Oh, man. The noticeable stuntman. <laughs> like... There was some scenes where that stuntman's head is so different than Bruce Willis. The, it was mad long. His hair was extra reddish brown. And it was like, yo, that's not you. Some yeah. scenes where you can tell it's not here. Because now it got me aware. I could know, like, right, that's not you. But those were good. I'm not even doing that. There was some, some kind of obvious ones that... Went over my head as a kid, and like I said, I haven't seen it in years. So me watching it again, it just, it was like, wow, like, like maybe two or three scenes, and that's totally not John. And I'm not even talking about the other scenes where you look for it. Like, because I started, no, but those were pretty decent. Now, there were like two or three ones, I was like, nah, that ain't even him. <laughs> like, 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 I think we needed to do something a little different there. But yeah. maybe because I'm up on my, like, the way it's situated watching it, it just, I just caught it. It, it was a little bit funny to me. But um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on any of my nitpicks. No, 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 no. I mean, actually, that's, I think your first nitpick is a good nitpick. You shot up the car. I think that's an actual good nitpick. That'll be a scene I have to revisit. I never, I never would have thought about that. But if you really want to, I really, I can see that. I can see that. So and what I, about I think, the stuff, man? Um, I, I, I'm gonna have to look at it again because I guess maybe I love the movie so much, but. I, I, I mean, but then that's but it's a minor thing for me. But yeah, right, but right, keep going. So, it's, so, so I will leave it at that. But I do, I can understand the whole shooting of the car. <laughs> yeah, man, like it, it just caught me off guard because at one point I was like, "I oh, shoot," and I'm like, "I think you, yeah, you're shooting down." I get it. It don't look like you're hitting. And it was like you pull back from another angle. You see more from the car, like. Cause like he was like moving like what the fuck yeah. you shooting and then it's like then you, then you see in the shots like is he shooting the car and then they'll pull back and it look like he's shooting off to the side so you can see the light going that way and then you back at the car where he's backing it up and it's like niggas you still shooting the car he already get the point like, like yo I think you you might hit him like you a little reckless breath brother so, chill out chill out I get it but um. All that being said, um, I do want to pick another pick out there, and I think it was more of the times because I have to put it out, and it's something that I never noticed, and it's weird that it fits with the time, and I'll walk it back. The moment where he gets to know um out, and he was like, well, you got a flat foot, and it was funny he was saying it because he was pulling the glass out of his feet at the time, and he could have obviously let them know it was open um open airway so you know the guys would have known that his feet was fucked up mm -hmm. so he was just like you got a flat foot what's that mean you know like you just a desk guy and whatnot mm -hmm. and then he tells a story he said oh, yeah. he shot a 13 year old and i'm thinking oh so the 13 year had was, was like the aggressor and he makes it a he point to a say gun, that yeah. he had a toy gun and it was dark and i couldn't tell and he just leaked. You could tell it fucks with him. And it almost makes you wonder, like, you ain't get locked up, but that's back in those days. But I liked how he expressed the anguish of making a fucking mistake like that. So, obviously, oh. if it wasn't his fault, and obviously, it goes through eternal affairs and all of that. And, and, and these, like, back his backstory really said a whole lot, even for the time we are today me watching that scene because it was like i haven't seen it in years so when he's going through it's like 13 i'm like oh 13 year old i like that man that's crazy because i'm thinking the kid was the aggressor like he the bad guy and he was like no not even that and he says yo it was just so so dark I, I didn't know what that gun was i couldn't tell that was a toy and he fired and they never say if the kid died or not i'm hoping the kid lived just because he's a nice guy and he never wanted to go back out there on the beat. So I'm assuming he had that option. So I'm assuming that the kid might not have died at all. Or he, 
I don't even think if he even mentioned that he hit the kid. Which, But the way he took it, it seemed like he might have. And the nuance of that moment, and for the times that we in today, and he was like, I took the desk job because just... Just what he just never, never drew, wanted to draw his gun again, and it's funny because there's a scene in Family Matters. I punched you back in now because now I'm not exactly sure. Like we got cut off a little bit, so where did I leave off at? That you, you heard left off with uh, the. Uh, 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 Al, where he made the mistake shooting the kid. Yeah, and they never really specify if I could catch you up. Um, I, I, they never really specified whether or not if he hit the kid or not. So you don't really know. Right. One of the things so, I did like what he said was. Well, well, well so, let me, so if I could I, finish, if I could finish. Excuse me. So they never really expressed whether or not he hits the kid or not. You would assume it goes through IA, of course, but the fact that they said it was his own, why he never wanted to get off of pencil du uh, desk duty, almost like it was a choice. Like, he could have went back out It did... I mean, he's still on a, a beat cop, but he, I guess he might have even actually alludes to mind of having been a higher station or why he never wanted to even go no further he just wanted to do regular routine shit and it seemed like it was a choice because he didn't want to draw his gun now where i'm not sh like like if you cut off there where i was getting to was it reminded me of an episode of his, his cop character which sometimes to me watching that m movie i always feel like in my mind and at some point i always thought that chicago had something to do with this film either he was a New York cop going to Chicago. Because I always felt like the building was in Chicago for some reason. Never L.A. Because when I seen the palm trees, I was like, this was L.A.? I thought it was Chicago. So my head was like, maybe he was a cop from Chicago. And they was like, he's from New York. And my mind was like, why did I always think this film took place in Chicago, though? But in any event, in Family Matters, it, it always feels like he's the same character. This is probably why I always felt like his name was Carl. But it always felt like he was playing the exact same character. And one thing he even said in the show was, I forget how many years he might have been on the beat. He said, yo, 15 years. I, I, I think he said he never drew his gun. And I think the episode might have been the first time he drew it. Okay. In, in Family Matters. But there was an episode where he talked about how many times he's drawn his gun. And that was the first time I realized that, yo, you're absolutely right. There's officers out here that, I mean, there's... They're not making movies out here on the streets every day. For Every day is not John McClane. There's a lot of officers that my whole life I've never even seen action. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. never. Like, never, never had to pull my pistol out for not a fucking reason. You know? So for him to say that, I didn't, I, I didn't want to pull my pistol out. So it gets up to that climax that the when he got, when the shooting happened, and you see him turn around, Bruce was turning around like, who the fuck popped him? And you see that lingering moment, it was like... Yeah, man, uh, back to action. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like, this was a guy that never wanted to draw his pistol. He had a whole story onto himself. And just like I said, it, it stood out to me watching it because it was like, how about that? Because the whole time I was engaged, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't want to draw his... I was like, oh, yeah, maybe the kid was the... not at all. Like, this was a legit mistake. And he... And again... So we had a little technical difficulty in the middle of, but um, where we were up to, I should say, is um, basically like I said, that my miscellaneous pick. It was just really because it was just a hallmark of the time, and for me watching it, and as I listened and was starting to recall it, and he told the story of shooting the kid. It was just like it was Tamir Rice just rang a bell. It was everything that we're dealing with right now and the fact that you could tell the weight of it was and the responsibility of it and how it made him recoil because clearly he's a he, he's a cop, you know, like just how he related to John McClain. You could tell that it, 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 it that was a moment in which he expressed, we expressed a lot of character development via a significant um, happenings that happened in his history, which will tell you a lot about how these guys could on a very, be very relatable to each other and how 
they didn't mind commanding the vulnerability it took to express like how John said that he's never said sorry before. Well, here you go right now. You see him express his vulnerability when asked about what kind of office he is. And if you see how they would talk to him, like even the commanding officer, they would look down at him as a flat foot. But you could clearly tell he he's in sync with this this cop shit. You know what I mean? Like, he could feel it out. Like, he could tell you you're doing certain things you didn't have to do. Like, that's not, don't start sending in the guys like this. We got a guy on the inside. Let's, most of our intel came from him. And even though you're right, we don't know who this guy is. He could feel it out. His his gut, he, he even talked about his gut, if I'm not mistaken, at one point. Mm -hmm. It's, you could just tell, like, it just like how she said, like, it's, he's doing his job. They're cops. They, when they're in mode, they're in mode. And you see how quick it was at the very end when the bad guy showed up without hesitation. Pull out. I'm still a cop. You know? And you could tell that it just telling the story, I'm supposed to protect and serve. And in that moment, and it was so dark, and, and he expressed how difficult it was, and I didn't do my job. But that's my job. And they never, like I said, they never talk about whether he died or the kid died or not. I guess they leave it up to your imagination. I kind of got the impression <laughs> you would think he died, but they never really specify because he's still working. He's still there. I mean, so, I mean, I, I, it was just a, a fascinating pick. I just wanted to sit outside of this because I don't want politics to be part of it. But it was a significant pick that stood out, at least to me watching it for the first time in years and realizing this was sitting here the whole fucking time. Mm -hmm. uh, thoughts? Well, no, that was a great, that's a great pick. And I remember the scene where he says to John McClane, you know, they could teach you, they can teach you everything as a cop except how to live with a mistake. Mm. And, and that was it. And I thought it came full circle where at the end, he was the only one that was with the work. Remember when the bad guy made that last guest appearance, who shot him? It was Al. He was the only one that was ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how about that? The guy that was the one that was only one that was ready was a guy that did right. took a desk and job, a beat was, job because he didn't remember, really want to be out there actively pulling his pistol. And, and the funny thing was, he was just John's earpiece. He didn't see no action, mm -hmm. but I think being there in John's earpiece, it started those the muscles started coming back there mm. because. You would think it was over, and when the bad guy made the last guest appearance, it was the most unlikely person who was the quick draw McGraw. Mm -hmm. and, and you see, when he shot him, the look on his face, like, he was almost in disbelief that I bust my gun. Mm -hmm. Like, it was almost like he probably didn't even think about it. <laughs> like, he were, and I guess maybe that was the moment he needed, but I thought it was a really touching scene where he said, you know, they teach you everything as a, as a rookie or whatever, except how to live with the mistake. I mean, that's a, 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 a absolutely right. And, I mean, I'll be honest with you, there's n nothing more poetic than to end it right there for such a 80s action flick. That is a good line to, to, to end on. It, it mm -hmm. says so much with using so little. Yeah, that's it. Uh so uh, I guess because this is my movie, I will try to take a lead or would you want to ask me something? Um, no, I mean, any final thoughts in referencing no, I mean, this uh, like I said, film I, to our viewers? I can't, listen, for for the viewers out there, if you haven't seen... Oh, Dark and, that's, and, and obviously that's it for my nitpicks. I only had those right. two. So, Omar, let me ask you a quick question before I give my last to the viewers. I have said that I think Die Hard is a perfect movie. And I have said that I think it is Academy Award winning, nominated. Not win, but I think that Die Hard is the top of the top of everything we discuss. Is there any part of you that agrees with me or you think I'm a little too far fetched? Well, but I mean, uh, I mean, I didn't you, want to finish your thought. Finish you, your don't thought. Have to have the, you don't have to have the same feeling I have. But. So as someone who just watched Die Hard, where, where do you see Die Hard on the, the scale of action movies or a movie as a whole? 
Well, talking with you over the years, and and especially as of late, realizing how how much of an affinity you have for the film, um, it made me start paying attention to it a lot more in terms of in memory. Now, watching it again, now it's sitting back, back as you asked me this question. I can honestly say, one, I already told you that from the very beginning, you could tell like this is a film that you could tell s- took was set, setting a new a new bar setting a new standard for action filmmaking down to changing up the aesthetic this was probably the first time we had the the blue collar every joe type of physique as opposed to the superhero or ultra muscular like like they'll have this this construction worker but not every construction worker look like they 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 body <laughs> build on the weekends no like regular construction worker looks strong looks like they can handle some shit but that don't mean that they got cuts and shit for days they're not walking it'll be, superheroes it'll be a, it'll be yeah, exactly. Like you don't have to do that. So, like, like I think this was the first time you had a b- very believable physique, and you know, like, and f- for the kind of character he was, he was a guy with the with a questionable hairline, <laughs> and, and and not not out of age. You could just tell that's just out also his head shape and just how his hairline is, and he still was able to carry off the leading man unassumingly kind of like the way you would say uh he the who's the new guy that played the daniel craig of the genre he was the first okay. guy that opened up that clearly you command the screen clearly you could tell like they got charisma they got a different type of rugged uh attractiveness to the ladies that you could tell that the girls would like them like, you know what I mean? Because you always, all the superheroes, the leading guys, they have an archetype of being, yeah, that's the action hero. Yeah, you could tell. Because they, 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 they have a certain type of aesthetic. Bruce Willis he, is completely the opposite archetype. He not, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, c- clearly I you mean, could tell that that he, he would be your Zach Morris and the girls will like. He could play that role. But he in the arch, as far as the archetype of the genre, especially at the time, he physically was not that. Mm-hmm. at all and for them to go with this kind of uh a uh, 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 rugged look the daniel craig look because i hear a lot of people said that about daniel craig in terms of aesthetically speaking when you think of him daniel craig the next 007 until you see him do the role then you'd be like i never thought to make yeah yeah make um 007 really have a rugged aesthetic instead of the pretty boy aesthetic and that that's what what i felt like they brought to the genre and i think that's a keynote and with and and just how they pasted out the roller coaster ride experience of a uh, of a well-crafted action film i i would have to say it it has to be up there as one of the most important action films created in the history of action films. I would have to say it's definitely, if there was a five, you damn, you know what, watching this movie, it, it better be, Die Hard has to be in the conversation. Uh, would I, can I say, would I say it, it should have been nominated? It wouldn't be fair for me to say because I would, I didn't know what was out at the time. I couldn't even tell you that year like that. So no, it just wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fair. No, I'm not, no, no, I just, um, let me explain it again. I'm not saying up against what came out. I'm just judging the film. If, if we're saying that they never, action films are never considered. If you considered an action movie, that you thought this is worthy of a nomination, could Die Hard be on that list? Um, not, 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 not what was up, but what came out. I, I don't even remember. Yeah, I understand. I understand it does have to win, but it should it even ha- could have been a, one of those films to have the recognition of being nominated? Um, as a film, like front to back, like you know, I think that. You know, I, I really think that... I would want to think on it a lot longer, but for the sake uh, of, obviously, the show, I'd have to... I'd With the option to possibly change, though I probably won't, I feel like I could be committed to it. Um, 
I would probably have to err on the side of yes, like that lethal weapon one, or uh, you know what I mean, like in terms of of that time, and if it would have had a nomination, yeah, I wouldn't. You know what? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I I would say if there had to be any of those times, yeah, yeah, nomination is. If anyone should had had a, a nomination for Oscar. I don't see why 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 Die Hard wouldn't be part of the conversation. Yeah, no, is that significant? Yeah, I, like I, I, I would yeah, say is I, that significant. I, I, yeah, I would say this, and, and, and you, I you guess you're the reason why I'm a little remiss is because you're so hard to see them even consider a film like that. I have to re yeah. readjust my lens for it because we, you know when we hear of uh, Oscar nominated films and performances, you you think of a different type of. Filmmaking, right, right, that's so that's why I'm like when I think of it, if there was any of those action films, because it's still considered like the action films with all the things that come with it, even the '80s yeah. cheese thing idea. That's it still carries a little bit of that into it. But to be honest, it's so yes, you know what I'd have to say, yeah, 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 for direct as a film and directing, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Like I said, I don't. I'm not looking for a win. I don't remember. You know, I'm just saying because you know that these type of movies never get recognized that way. And I think it is one of those movies that can be recognized. And again, I, I do believe this: if you are a filmmaker who wants to direct action movies, I think that you would be doing yourself a disservice if you were like, "What are the movies I should study? If Die Hard is not in the list. You know what I mean? No, I feel you. I actually you really... Coming out, you, you went to film school and you're like, yo, I, I want to direct action movies. Okay, what movies did you like? Well, I watched this, this, and this. Oh, you mean Die Hard wasn't on your list? Oh, no, you got to go back. Hmm. No, nah, no, nah, actually, I, I, like I said, I would have to, I would have to agree. I think this film is that significant, especially to the genre, but also as a submission and just quality filmmaking. And then you think about Passenger 57, Under Siege, Mr. Speed. These are all John McClane's babies. Babies, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are their children, yeah. <laughs> These are all John McClane's babies. Well, to well, we're at that end point, so any that that's your final thoughts? Yeah, my final thought is to the audience before we say goodbye. If you haven't seen Die Hard, I implore you to please go check it out. For those of the audience members, obviously I said it was dated 1988. For the audience members that may be born in the 90s, maybe in your early 20s, it is one of those movies that you can go back. It, to me, it stands the test of time. Like Magic Illmatic or Biggie's Ready mm -hmm. to Die. I think it stands the test of time. And I think you should, if you haven't seen Die Hard, you should see it. And for those who haven't seen it in a long time, revisit it. I think that it is, to me, to me, the greatest action movie ever made. And if it's not the greatest, it should be on the Mount Rushmore action movie. And I'll leave it at that. Well, I mean, if I could close, I do, again, I do feel like Die Hard is a film that, I mean, yeah, I, I make jokes about how you could notice some of the stunt guys, but, I mean, outside of that, and those are just, like, relative nitpicks, it is a well-crafted film, hands down, and, and it is worth uh, worth the study, especially if you want to know how to pace a, a, a well-crafted action film. I think this is something that you want to keep at, in your notebook. You know, mm -hmm. um, but just in terms of just like, like I said, I mean, it's all about one thing I love about our throwbacks is and I really hope that we reach back and we we're going to cover a lot of different genres just moving forward. I mean, it's all about just watching these films, enjoying them, seeing them from a different lens and also just appreciating all the corners of filmmaking that actually can stand out in films. I mean, sometimes you see in some of our picks, it's. It could. It don't have to always be the cast. It could actually be the aesthetic, the what mm -hmm. stands out, or the pacing that actually presses forward to your mind. That always makes you want to revisit these films. And um, that's about it 
for me, but it's I will say this is it is a time capsule worthy movie of of the eighties. Like if you need an eighties something that could signify eighties action films, if there was three, definitely Die Hard should be in there. Um, with that being said, with that being said, now it's not about what we think. It's all about what you guys out wait, there wait, wait, think. Wait, wait, wait a minute, you you missed the question. Oh, oh, shit, shit, shit. Yes. Yeah, thank you, thank the you. Question. The question that we did have was, is this uh, Die Hard a Christmas movie? I will still say, and one of my, my bros out back just came in the middle of recording, and I, between filming, I actually was talking to him about it. He said the same thing as me in terms of, you don't really think of this as a Christmas movie. I never thought of it as a Christmas movie as a kid, like Christmas movies, but it's so Christmas. That's the best way I can answer it. It's not a Christmas movie, but it is so Christmas down to the fields. I, I, I think I've watched it around Christmas before now thinking about it. I mean, I'm sure I've watched it several times around that time anyway, like any time, but definitely around it. But it never was a movie I would go to for a Christmas mood, but now, I don't know. I might. I might, but is it a Christmas movie? I'll say no, but I have to say it because I have to choose. I like to, I have to be committal, but it definitely can be. How about you? Um, as much as I love the movie, I would say no. And why I say no is no. Christmas is the reason why he goes out there during the holiday season. I do not think Christmas plays a key role. I think that if you, let's say he went out there 4th of July, I think you have the same movie. I think you have the same movie. I think if so, you did, if they did, they would have put I made it a 4th of July. I feel like they would have made it a 4th of July movie with the fireworks, but, but when, carry like, on. Right, like, for example... You know, at the end where he straps the gun to his back, the Christmas, you know, tape. Mm -hmm. Guess what? If it was 4th of July, or it wasn't during the holiday season, he would have just found regular duct tape. You know what I mean? Like, I really don't think that Christmas plays such a significant role. No, 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 not particularly. So I would say, I would say no. It's not a Christmas movie in the holiday spirit. <laughs> I don't think it plays a key role in the movie, as much as I love it. Well, that, well, that's the question of the day. So, you guys, leave it in the comments below. What do you think? The infamous question will always be ringing and hanging over the head of this film is Die Hard. An action, just, just a regular, Chris, is it a Christmas film or is it not? We leave it up to you guys to decide. Fence it out. Talk down below in the comments section. So, again, as always, like, share, subscribe. See you next time. And as always, so I have a better outro. Chill. Until next Say one more time. Until next time.